The Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Milton Brady, Chairman of the Board of Cygnus Capital, respective Board Chairman, my fellow executives and team members, distinguished invited guests, both in person and online, members of the Cygnus family, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Value creation and de-risking are two critical components for success in the global real estate industry. Here's a look at the flow of my brief presentation this morning. First, we'll highlight real estate as an alternative investment cl asset class on a global and a local stage. Then we'll outline how value is created and how one can de-risk real estate investments. I will briefly touch on a case study from a live Cygnus real estate finance project before finishing with some potential investment opportunities for your consideration. We also have program in five minutes to take a few questions. Historically, real estate as an asset class has outperformed most others through its protracted growth and attractive rates. Real estate offers great investment opportunities whilst protecting and improving quality of life and remains an effective way to build wealth. It typically yields above equities and bonds and usually provides investors with a stable income stream. If you think about it, tenants have a legal obligation to pay rent versus dividends which are discretionary. Furthermore, bonds can default, whereas new tenants can always be found to lease, purchase, a new, a lease or purchase a new asset. Despite the uncertainty and upheaval that the world has been experiencing over the past few years, from COVID-19 to disrupted supply chains, the war in Ukraine, inflation, inflation, sorry, rising interest rates, a spike in the price of the commodities essential to the real estate industry, such as steel and lumber, labor shortages, and a potential fuel sh shortage in commodity producing economies. The graph you see on screen now depicts the fact of how real estate as an asset class has continued to perform. Ups and downs they are, but the regression to the mean shows a distinct, steady upward trajectory. On the local scene, our real estate industry remains robust throughout, remained, has remained robust throughout the pandemic, and in fact, been one of the main growth drivers in our economy. According to an article in the Sunday Papers a few weeks ago, last year alone, the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation approved building permits for just under 600 residential projects alone, totaling around 450,000 square meters. This equates to 4.8 million square feet of new construction at an average of 8,000 square feet per development. The fact that we, are, we have a growing number of successful entities, including major financial institutions involved in or entering into the real estate development space is testament to the health of Jamaica's real estate market. Our own assessment of the various segments of the Jamaican market are that we are constructively bullish on the industrial segment, we are bullish on hospitality, especially the luxury segment, and this is globally, neutral on residential, though low income and the luxury subsectors are performing well, as you can see from the housing demand numbers, and those numbers are from the NHT. And we are constructively bullish on the commercial segment where we ourselves have a major investment which we will touch on shortly. Now to value creation. The question is, how do you create value in real estate? Well, we'd like to highlight a few ways in which you can. First, it is important to realize that the main, stru the, the main strategy surrounding creating value in real estate is the concept of buy, 
fix and sell. Clearly, you want to buy low, fix and sell high. And the fix, of course, being in, in um, parentheses, the essence is what constitutes the fixing component. Fixing can mean design and develop, refurbish, repurpose, upgrade, and the list goes on. Please note that fixing can also simply mean maintaining an asset's income in a period of uncertainty, such as we are arguably experiencing now in some sectors. Here are some specific ways which you can create value. First, getting ahead of major trends before the market has recognized these trends to be the new normal. This may sound simple, but to illustrate this concept, I'd like to use one of the world's greatest ice hockey players of all time, Wayne Gretzky. Wayne was once asked about the secret of his success that made him stand out from all other ice hockey players on the rink. His answer was simple. The other players always skate towards the puck. I, on the other hand, skate to where I think or calculate the puck is going to end up, which makes me appear to be a step ahead of the field. That is exactly one way you can create value in real estate. Figure out where the puck is going to end up and skate towards that. And we have a perfect example coming up in the case study. Second way of creating value in real estate is through joint ventures. Simply put, joint ventures allow you the chance to create a pipeline of value that is unavailable to the rest of the market. Of course, this comes along with all of the other advantages that JVs pre present, such as shared risk, shared resources, additional credibility, as well as access to additional experience, expertise, and knowledge. The third way of creating value is by investing against instead of with the herd. This simply means unlocking the lot by going against the herd to find pockets of value. Again, the case study will show how we've used this to our advantage. Another way of adding value is by conceptualizing how innovation can provide opportunities for future generations and the life of buildings and assets. This equates to the correct perception and recognition of, of opportunities, and in some instances, even doing what others say cannot be done or are unwilling to do. Fifth, problem solving. A major reason why many real estate assets remain locked, with a large portion being attributable to a lack of access to capital. Just as Jason would have alluded to, and prior the Minister of Finance, it's a problem solving approach, particularly with respect to creative structuring of real estate investments, which will go a long way to improving returns by removing hurdles and act as accessing a property's true value. Sixth and final is that we're highlighting today, change the use of a property so that the new use has greater value than the cost of the change. Put another way, value adds occur when the marginal dollar invested in the property produces more than a dollar of value. And this can reposition the property for immediate increases in market value or additional rental income. Now to de-risking. Here are a few key considerations in de-risking a real estate development or project. First, the governance must be bespoke and appropriate with clearly defined roles, authority, limits, decision-making processes, and policies clear to all. The bespoke governance plan of necessity needs to be appropriate to the circumstances. The plan needs to be developed in collaboration with all stakeholders, endorsed at the highest level, and implemented at the commencement of the project. Most importantly, there should be no situation where the governance plan is set aside. Second is risk management, where there must be an established risk register with an early and honest assessment of all of the potential risks so that the, that the risk register is there from the beginning and is reviewed and revised regularly so that difficult, complex, and high-risk elements are not addressed too late in the project. Additionally, it is essential that risks sit with the party best able to manage it. 
Third, investments should be fundamental or based on fundamentals and not speculation. It's very easy to fall in love with a property and your own vision of what you can make of it. Unfortunately, as I'm sure we all agree, emotion is not the best investment advisor because this can lead to aggressive assumptions and potentially bad outcomes. Of course, the ability to finance a deal doesn't make a bad deal into a good one. Fourth, design economically, or put another way, understanding the implications of design. It's easy to hire an architect to design a beautiful structure, but should art lead the project or should the economics? It is important to understand that a design incorporating unconventional elements will not just cost more, but will also take more time to deliver. While innovative and cutting edge engineering can inspire admiration, it is also hard to design and makes it more challenging to find craftsmen and contractors to construct it properly. In high value engineering projects, such as the aeronautical, in aeronautical industry, particular emphasis is placed on considering whole life cycle because investments are so high and it's difficult to recover projects where the wrong decisions have been made up front. Fifth, ensuring realism. One of the main reasons for a, for a blowout in project time frames is because time allowed to, to, for the bill element has been compressed. It is rarely possible to complete the construction phase more quickly than it was initially planned. Avoid unrealistic projections, manage expectations, and allow resources and costs to be planned with accuracy. Six is inadequate cash flow, which will grind you to a halt without it being carefully planned and without a pursuit cost budget. You need to appropriately add values and include any and all exclusions and price in risk. If the costs aren't properly understood, this can lead to misinformation, sometimes making it look like the project has gone over budget when in fact it was not the case. It wasn't properly budgeted in the first instance. This of course may mean front loading some costs to get the riskier subjects addressed first, which of course may make a project look front loaded with expense, but it is to manage risk. Communication and good stakeholder management, the final consideration in the risk in real estate projects is maintaining the quality and consistency of stakeholder management and project communications. A communication plan should be developed early on and maintained for the duration of the project to build momentum and interest around the project, as well as to ensure messages provided to leadership, contractors, key stakeholders, and the wider community are regular and unambiguous. Good internal and external communication also informs the market from the development stage of the project contributing to project awareness and, and interest. In addition, good informal communication between the members of the broader team will lead to early identification and rectification of project issues as they arise. I also like to use this chart to explain the importance of stakeholder management in real estate and construction in Jamaica. So on screen, it's what I call a power interest matrix. On the left-hand side, the y-axis is um, the power, and I describe power as who has the power to stop your real estate project. Um, the bottom left is high, top left is low. On the x-axis on the bottom of the screen is interest, and it really is the, who has interest in your project. So in other words, where does your project sit on their priority list? And clearly, the dangerous quadrant here is the person who has the power to stop your project, but, has, but it is at the bottom of their priority list. Notice the bottom left quadrant, which is the red quadrant, is the most full. Every single one of those players in that box can stop your project. Individually, not collectively, individually. So that could be Parish Council, NEPA, Fire Brigade, NWA, the list goes on. And the idea is, it just gives you a sense about stakeholder management, about due diligence, about understanding the complexities of, of real estate, because there is a very, very large um, grouping of, of regulatory entities, for the most part, 
who all can individually stop your project, and your project is nowhere, they have 50 other projects that they're, that they're looking after, so it's nowhere near the top of their priority list. So that, I think, you know, top left, you notice it's, 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 it's pretty much empty. Clearly, most developers are in the bottom right hand quadrant, but the dangerous quadrant is in red. Finally, people. Establishing a strong team of experienced of experience professionals to lead projects is fundamental. Simply put, select and match the team with the level of project risk strategies, and strategies also require people with the correct operational experience. So before we go on to the case study, let me outline briefly a little bit about Cygnus Real Estate Finance. In Cygnus Real Estate Finance, or SRF in short, which falls under our Alternative Investment Solutions Platform, has as its mandate the provision of flexible capital to unlock the value of real estate across the region whilst delivering risk-adjusted returns for our investors and shareholders. What do we mean by flexible capital? Simply put, Cygnus Real Estate Finance takes a careful look at every real estate opportunity and we deploy either equity or debt appropriately structured to bring a project to life, which in many instances would not measure up to the traditional loan conditions required by a commercial bank. Some of the flexible capital instruments we use include mezzanine financing, debt financing, asset swaps, profit sharing notes, and preference shares, to name a few. And we deploy this capital at the value creation stage of the real estate life cycle. So on to the story of one Belmont. Picture this, that was William. <laughs> We are in the middle of a pandemic with most of the global workforce working from home. Indeed, many are questioning whether or not we have seen the end of the commercial office as we knew it, with work from home potentially becoming the new normal. Through a joint venture partnership, we conceptualized, designed, and commenced construct construction of, a, of an 80,000 square foot Class A office, medium rise building, no retail space with abundant parking on four levels, including a basement. Do you recognize some of the value creation and de risking buzzwords that we just alluded to? Joint venture, because this was an opportunity not available to the rest of the market. Investing against the herd, and note, of course, The picture of, sorry, I had a picture of the current state of the building, but I'm sure most of you have driven past on Belmont Road and have, would have seen the building under construction and the crane in place, the, the construction is, is far advanced. The, current is cur the project is currently on budget and on schedule, a testament to SRF, not just talking about value creation and de-risking, but actually doing it. Some of the other buzzwords you can see there is the creation of long-term investor value, designed economically. To give you a good sense of value creation here, we knew that parking was an issue at most commercial buildings across Kingston. You go to most places, you can't find somewhere to park. So we were deliberate in ensuring that this building exceeded the required amount of parking from the regulatory authorities. So we have four parking levels. So you will never go to this building to conduct business and not be able to park your car. Because that was something that we were adamant from the very first day in the design of, of the building. And as of today, four of the five floors are, 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 are leased. So, So 
So taking the leap to invest against the herd, skating to where we, we calculated the puck was going to be is what produced one Belmont. And the, the, the testament of the strength of the strategy is the fact that four of the five floors are, are already leased. And the fifth floor, we have multiple entities that have shown interest in leasing the fifth and final floor. So value creation, the SRF way. So what are some of the investment opportunities that are available for potential investors? Clearly, there's the purchase of SRF shares, which, uh, similar to Jason pointed out, are currently undervalued. So there's a, a significant opportunity there for persons who may be interested in purchasing shares of SRF, which are listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, both in USD and JMD. Of course, SRF is buttressed by, just as SCI, a robust pipeline of commercial, hospitality, industrial, and residential projects. Second, there, is, there are off-take opportunities in a major commercial project, which I just highlighted, via the purchase of the fully leased floors. Third, we have a major industrial park project in the planning stages at Lake Spen on 55 acres which represents an opportunity for equity investors, for lease of warehouses, and ultimately for the purchase of lease warehouses. Finally, we have equity, preference share, and debt opportunity in a major luxury hospitality project, as well as the purchase of, of income earning villas. And for details of any of the above, we're happy to have discussions on the margin. So here's a look at the four members of the Cygnus real estate team and all of the entire team is here today so we we're certainly will be available for have to have discussions on the margins for anybody who needs more information on Cygnus, Cygnus real estate. I'd like to leave you with, before we have questions, one very short video clip which highlights the Mami Bay project which is we are about to launch. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause. I, I, I particularly loved your, your presentation. It was just so clean and so succinct and very easy to understand. We had mentioned earlier, especially for those of you who might be joining us um, right now, maybe you didn't hear it earlier, um, the role of, of Cygnus and the, the different pillars. You had the private... Um, credit. credit, and then we're speaking about real estate, and then later on we'll hear about uh, private equity. We have a question for you. With the ship, and by the way, I think my biggest takeaway from you was when you said emotion isn't the best investment advisor, especially with everyone being so you know passionate about what's going on in the building industry. Certainly. I think what you really did was show us that emotion is never ever the best Absolutely. investment um, advisor. Question, with the shift of work culture to include more remote working, how do you see this impacting the commercial real estate segment? So you spoke about one of the fundamentals, which was betting against the herd, investing against the herd, but with this reality of um, remote work, how, you know, how do we look at that and the impact on the commercial space? Um, so that's an excellent question, and it's one that we have spent considerable time to research the answer. The, at the start of the pandemic, there was a, a trend that the world felt work from home was going to be the new normal. But increasingly, as time went on, companies found that innovation was not as productive as it, as, as it could. Certainly tech companies, a number of entities, found that when you're in your basement, in your pajamas, in front of a, a, a Zoom screen, you, don't, you miss those moments of collaboration in the workspace, uh, around the coffee machine, during the lunchtime, when collaboration, problem solving, and innovation works best. So a lot of companies found that they began to lose the edge. The corporate culture was also 
suffering. So not long after, we all began to see the trend of a lot of little major corporations around the world inviting their staff to come back to the office. It started in London, Canary Wharf, in New York, Wall Street. The trend began to grow. Let's get people back to the office because the company saw a noticeable decline in the culture, in productivity, in, in innovation. Um, so, and that that's was one of the elements that we use to understand the investment in one Belmont. There are also some other functions that you, you, you can't do over a, a, a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting. You need to, when you're doing deals of 100, 200, 300 million US dollars, you need to meet people face to face, shake hands, look in each other's eyes and not through a screen. So, and the third element I'd like to highlight is that there are some functions that can be done, certain back office functions that may be more suited to work, work from home, um, that you're not necessarily client facing, but in the client facing space, um, we believe that there will, there will continue to be a need for commercial real estate, as well as the multinationals, the embassies, the large corporates and so on, they will always need a physical space to transact their business. So our research was quite detailed, it wasn't just in Jamaica, it was globally, um, but we were absolutely convinced, and we have proven so by the lease take up of our One Bellman project, that the research was accurate, and we are convinced that the office is here to stay, but yes, there is a hybrid nature of the future of the future workspace where some functions can be done and continue to be done from home but there will always be a space and a need for office space including classy office space such as one belmont thank you so very much um i like when decisions are driven by data don't we all um it's you know please applaud uh, absolutely absolutely <laughs> Going back to what he said earlier about just emotion, it's interesting that what he said, Malcolm Gladwell, who happens to be my, one of my favorite authors, just got a lot of backlash and he got a lot of flack for saying something similar, where he said, you know, the pajamas, people, you know, staying behind a screen is not productive and it actually damages the culture and really and truly the data has absolutely shown that. So it isn't to discredit the fact that there are remote jobs and that of course persons can work from home in their pajamas, right. But saying in this kind of climate, we definitely need to look at the data and make decisions sure. based on that data. I have a question here for you. Where are, by the way, any questions in the room? Any questions in the room? I know his, 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 um, his presentation was very good. Where are the pockets of opportunities that SRF will be looking to do further investment? So we saw Belmont, you mentioned Miami Bay, we saw the industrial park. Are there other any are there any other areas for, for opportunities where real estate is concerned? Sure, there uh, they are. Um, another excellent question. And we approach this by segment. Uh, it's not a one size fits all for investments for us. What works in the residential sector may not work in hospitality, may not work in commercial or in industrial. Um, I gave a sense of our outlook on each segment in the presentation in terms of the, where we were bullish, where we were, where we were neutral. What I'll say is Cygnus is looking at opportunities, not just in Cygnus Real Estate Finance, not just in Jamaica, but also on, on just as SCI in the, the wider Caribbean sphere. We have a number of opportunities in the pipeline that, that we are looking at. Hospitality is one area that clearly uh, the Caribbean is the fastest growing recovery destination post the pandemic. The leisure, the leisure market is, is um, recovering nicely and the luxury sector in particular, there is actually a shortage of luxury product available on a global stage. So we are, we, we are, we are particularly bullish uh, on, on that space. So hospitality is one area we see investment opportunity on the horizon and continue to see because that is not just something that would be relevant for Jamaica, but for other Caribbean territories as well. The residential, clearly, there are different segments within the resi with residential market. The low income market, we know there is a significant demand. We saw the numbers from NHT 
almost 280,000 houses are in demand in, in, the, in the low income sector. The, uh, uh, the challenge, that market operates differently from the middle and the upper end of the, of the residential market. They all have different characteristics. Um, so clearly each, you know, we would carefully decide which of those market spaces we would find the opportunities. The commercial segment, as we spoke about already, um, very clearly having just done 80,000 square foot successfully, um, we have other opportunities based on our investment properties that you will see on our balance sheet. So we do have some prime properties, including the French Embassy or the former French Embassy that, that, that we purchased and other properties are, are on Kingston. So we have many future pipe and opportunity to create more value in the space and on the industrial scene as well. Um, you know, clearly, we, we have a, an investment property that we're looking at to do uh, uh, um, out in the Lakesman areas where we have 55 acres on our balance sheet right opposite Wisinko on the Lakesman Road. And that's another significant opportunity for us. Um, and the idea is, is we are constantly keeping our pipeline robust because ultimately, you know, we're a publicly traded company and our, our, we're doing it for our shareholders. So. Thank you so very much. Lady, oh, I have a question. I, oh, I have two. Okay, I will take these two questions. If I could get a mic to the second row. We also have a question in the third. You can stand. Tell me where you're from. Right there. Thank you so very much. It's a hot topic, Mr. Cummings. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Yashi Hall. I'm with Cygnus. Um, David, I wanted to ask you specifically about the material uh, complexity in terms of the prices post-pandemic, even pre-pandemic. How do you manage the volatility in those prices across your segments and the logistical issues that come with that? Thank you. Um, that is another excellent question. And it's a part of our de-risking strategy. So during the pandemic, and not just the pandemic, also induced by the war in Ukraine, there have been significant disruptions to the global, to global, global supply chain. That resulted in certain commodities, steel, lumber, cement and so on, beginning to climb to levels that were quite frankly unsustainable for the construction industry. The way we at Cygnus approach that is number one, Forward purchasing is what, what one option which we have done for multiple projects. So, in the case of of of, uh, of one Belmont, we forward purchased 800 tons of steel to lock in the price at a certain value. So clearly, it means cash out the door earlier than you had projected in your in your in your cash flow. But the benefit you get is that you have locked in the price at a certain value. So you you avoid the fluctuations of the increasing uh, steel prices and locking a certain value that you had in your financial model. So th that is one strategy that we employ is through forward purchasing. The other thing we, we, that we can do to mitigate against the supply chain disruptions is what we create a long lead, long lead time list. And that list essentially is a compendium of those commodities that will take a long time to arrive. For example, right now, transformers are, there's a global shortage of, of transformers. If you need a transformer today, it'll probably take you 18 months to get one. There, there are certain things that will normally take three months, you're taking nine months and 12 months. So the way you mitigate that in construction, or the way you de-risk that is you are buying things a, long, a lot earlier than you normally would. So if it's an 18-month project and you need a transformer that takes 18 months, day one of the project, you, you have to order that transformer. So your cash flow profile may seem distorted because you're putting cash out the door earlier in order to mitigate against that particular risk. So, so, so we employ particular strategies to mitigate that, whether it is through advanced purchases to lock in the price to avoid the fluctuation or through uh, a compendium of long lead time items that feeds back into the project schedule to, to order things a lot sooner than you would, have, than you would normally order them. 
Um, we don't know when it may go back to normal. We don't know if this will be the new normal. But the idea is that it clearly a long lead time item, compendium, is going to be an essential component of any project plan from day one. Fantastic question. Great answer. Question. Ma it's on. Morning, Maya Wolver, and I'm with Jamaica Producers. Um, one of the sort of sub-segments you haven't really touched on, and I would love kind of your view as to the, the opportunity is really in the sub-segment of the retail space. Um, you know, it is, from a trend perspective, something that just before the pandemic, there was a fair amount of investment across Jamaica in this space particularly with sort of smaller footprint retail. Um, not as much on the large scale. Uh, you know, you take the example of Price Mart that took 10 years to find a new space at, in Portmore. Curious to hear your thoughts on where the retail space is going, particularly with global trends around e-commerce and those sorts of things, really disrupting the space in uh, uh, markets like the US. But where is it going in Jamaica? Thank you, great question. Sure. Uh, 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 thanks, Maya. Um, the, so, so, the, so the retail, uh, as you said, just a sub-segment, something that we are still assessing. Um, when we were looking at the industrial, for example, although during the pandemic there was exponential growth in the demand for industrial warehousing space, we soon got to a plateau, and we saw recently where Amazon themselves are trying to offload, I think, up to 10 million square feet of, of, of warehouses because everybody was pretty much, let's say, Amazon out. And we, we are going into a period of, of, of uncertainty, so a lot of household spending has been curtailed. And what that translated to, and I'm speaking on the U.S. market here to come back to, to, to Jamaica, is that a lot of the big box stores in the U.S. suddenly found that they had excess inventory. And when, when those stores have excess inventory, they then have to lower prices to get rid of the inventory and so on. So there is still a lot of fluidity in that space that we are still assessing. So as of today, I couldn't say that we are bullish or neutral or negative on that particular space because we are still assessing it. It also feeds into our potential warehouse project, because that's a, an area where, you know, it, 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 you know, there's opportunity there for us to include some of that in that particular project, but we have made no decision on that space as yet. I'll, I'll tell you though, back to the one Belmont project, which I think is a classic case, we looked at the floor plate. It, 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 for those of you who have driven past it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a substantial building. The floor plate is 16,000 square feet. There was a thought for us to do retail on a, on a plate. But back to the value creation I spoke about in terms of if we divided that 16,000 square foot floor plate, you then have to create corridors and common areas, which means you lose saleable area. So our strategy for that building was deliberately targeted at individual entities that would take an entire floor. And that way, from an economic perspective, the moment you step out the elevator, that entire space becomes leased to one entity. So you don't lose any square footage in saleable air or, or in income. So, I, and I probably haven't answered the question in the way you'd like, because the fact is we are still assessing the retail space uh, or that particular sub-segment of the market. And if we see the opportunity for us to enter into it, we have the capacity because we have the uh, the inventory, uh, as in the land bank on our balance sheet, and clearly we have the, 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 the capacity to take advantage of the opportunity should it present itself. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of Maya. I think it's much better to have a, a speaker answer honestly, you know, openly and with transparency that, you know, there isn't necessarily a decision right now because we're still in the process of analyzing and assessing. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for David Cummings.